our next panel um, is all about the journey. Um, and we are very lucky to have with us today Rob Draper, who is the former manager of the National Scenic Byways uh, Program at the Federal Highway Administration and a board member of the National Scenic Byways Foundation. Joining Rob will be Dr. Doug Harmon from Fort Worth, who is former president and CEO of the Fort Worth Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, and he is now working in the tourism, in, he has been working in the tourism industry for 25 years and has created a consulting group. Um, from our perspective, his biggest fame to claim is that he's married to Judy Harmon, <laughs> longtime Scenic Texas board member. Um, these two gentlemen will be joined by Dr. Carol Lewis, longtime friend of Scenic Houston, professor of transportation studies and director of the Center of Transportation and Training and research at the universe uh, at Texas Southern University as um, well as a former um, Houston Metro chair. Carol will be sharing her insights on why Houston continues to have public transit system that is free from advertising. So we'll get a rural urban uh, and urban perspective on how to get there. Um, please welcome these three. So you can either use the forward and back buttons, or you, I bet this clicker here, you do left, right. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll do this. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks to, uh, for all you hangers honors. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. As Doug mentioned uh, mentioned to me the other day, that or last night, he said that we're the uh, ones between you and the and the uh, reception. So we'll do our best to uh, to move along quickly and uh, um, and get everything out there quick. I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate uh, and represent the foundation. The Scenic, Scenic America has just been a, a long time supporter of, of Scenic Byways and in, and in many ways we uh, just have a, a long standing and kindred, a kindred interest in Byways and we just uh, appreciate uh, all that you've done for Byways over the years. Um, Max asked me to talk about the value of Scenic Roads, the status of Byway programs and some of the um, the, the value, you know, the value of byways and whatnot, and uh, so I'll, I'll be jumping right into that. Uh, first, I wanted to give you a little, little promotion slide on the uh, National Scenic Byway Foundation. We look a lot like many byway organizations, uh, probably look a lot like uh, Scenic America in a way, in that we have a volunteer board, um, volunteer staff, and uh, we're just all volunteer. And what happened? Nope, you're fine. Okay. I'm gonna move the computer down. You use the clicker. You can put your notes right up here. Oh, that'd be absolutely wonderful. All right. A little on the spot. Uh, Thank you, sir. Set up. Thank you. Yeah, that'll help. No, just use this. Left okay. Right. That works for me. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. I'm. Um, I've been retired for about seven years now, and this is probably the first presentation I've done on byways, and so, so I'm a little rusty at some of this stuff. But I did uh, did do my best to prepare and appreciate. Uh, so that's why I have uh, have my notes with me. Um, so let me, uh, so yes, we are you know we are a volunteer, and our vision is to is for byways to be recognized and valued worldwide for their distinctive stories and treasured places and and uh, all unique activities that, that people can do along byways. Um, I you know I, I I felt guilty about this slide as I was listening to about the, the trends on sedentary <laughs> activities and and. Uh, Driving and you know being the, the evil auto and, and all that, but uh, <laughs> people do drive for pleasure for whatever reason, and uh, and they and they and they and they seem to be doing it more. Uh, the data is based on uh, the National Survey for Recreational 
and uh, environment by the Forest Service. They collect information on participation in all outdoor activities, fishing, hunting, cycling, wildlife viewing. It's done with the, it's, it's done with the travel survey. Um, what happened that time? Oh, there we go. It's all, we're all back, okay. Rockwell, I, uh, Rockwell's a, a favorite of mine and, and with you know every story telling a picture um, and byways off rich, offer rich, powerful stories and a authentic experience. A, by, a byway ties a corridor together and ties an area together physically and it provides a unifying basis for, for communities and, and areas to come together. Uh, I don't know how much you all might know about Rockwell, but the way that he, when he envisioned uh, a piece of work, he would, in Stockbridge, he'd go out and get people in the, in, in the village and take pictures of them and then he would, he would uh, do sketches and before he did his final, final piece of work, he would do, all, do a full scale in black and white. And, and, uh, and so one of, the, one of his things that he would say is the last thing I add is color. And to me, that's what a byway does. It adds color to an area. Byways are typically um, recognized for, the, for, the, for their intrinsic qualities as we refer to them, scenic, natural, and, uh, and recreational, which are related to the land and historic, cultural, and uh, archeological related to people. I wanted to jump right into some of the economic impact studies that have been done on byways. There's an array of, one, of, of studies that are out there. Um, all of these are, are showing kind of the annual economic activity associated with the byway. Um, they vary with respect to the complexity and the sophistication of the methodology. Uh, they vary in scope. Um, you have Route 66, which is uh, 2,400 miles long. This particular study happened to look at the, more at the impact of heritage tourism and museums and, and Main Street programs, but Route 66 is a byway, so it's kind of considered a byway study. The New Mexico study is a statewide. Uh, the Flint Hills is a 103 mile byway in, in uh, Kansas, and the Blue Ridge Parkway is 470 miles in Virginia, North Carolina. It's much about, a, Blue Ridge is as much about a park experience as it is about a, a road experience. Uh, I thought I'd show you a little bit, delve into one particular study just because, just to kind of illustrate how they're done, and, and then I thought that the, this study was uh, particularly relevant to the, to the conference. Um, the the uh, Paul Bunyan Scenic Byway is uh, 54 miles long in central Minnesota. Uh, there's two, two counties, 14 jurisdictions, and it kind of goes through a whole area of lakes and places for birding and fishing and hiking and whatnot. They, uh, the University of Minnesota did an intercept, intercept survey where they would separate residents and, and travelers before they did the questionnaires. The residents would be queried about the impact of the, their perceptions of the impact of the, of the byway on, of its importance to the, uh, of, of the, of tur the, uh, the importance of tourism to the economy, the extent to which the byway contributes to that, and uh, uh, on the, the residents would be, and the, whereas the travelers would be, they'd be queried about their spending and how they got there and how they're getting around, how long they're spending, or how long they're, they're planning to stay. Uh, the sampling was done by volunteers. It was done between June and October 2010. Uh, they would walk up to uh, every third travel party that came, in, that they encountered, ask who had the most recent birthday, and then interview that particular person, just to kind of give you a sense of how it was, how the data was collected. They interviewed 337 respondents, uh, 198 were residents, 139 were travelers. Uh, their goal was to get to 400, but couldn't quite do it because it is volunteers. And then they would cleaned up their data and, and uh, smoothed out some of the curves, if you will, and looked at the annual average, annual average uh, uh, daily traffic, AD, AADP, uh, took out the, the commercial vehicles. So the non-commercial vehicles, they have about 1.1 million a, a, uh, per year. 41% of these, based on the survey, 41% of these vehicles were travelers, i.e. non-residents, and uh, so that's 457,000 travelers. And 5% of these were, when they were asked, they, were, they came to the area specifically because of the byway. And, that's, and so the 23,800 uh, represents 5% uh, of, the, of the travelers, total travelers. Um, 
of the byway that makes a difference to the, to the residents. The residents were asked about their perceptions of the important byway to, to 14 different community, act, uh, uh, community attributes uh, on, a scale, on a scale of one to five. And these were the top three, uh, preservation of natural areas, and recreational opportunities, and community beauty. Um, I want to get now into the origins of the National Scenic Byway programs. Um, sometimes happen, particularly at the federal level, we study a lot before we act sometimes, you know, and uh, some, some of those studies generate a lot of big ideas. There was a panel in 60, a White House panel in 65, uh, where there was a White House conference on natural beauty in 65, where there was a panel on scenic roads, the Highway Beautification Act also included, uh, 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 emphasized uh, scenic development and road beautification for federal aid highways but there really wasn't any money associated with that, so that didn't, not, not much, that didn't go too far. Um, the, the study in, in 74, the report to Congress, uh, looked at the national designation of scenic roads, corridor protection, and scenic enhancements, and complementary facilities. Another commission, Commission on American Out Outdoors, they recommended that state and local governments create a, a network of scenic byways and, and take action to protect the resources along the byways and that Congress established an incentive program of matching, pro of matching grants uh, out of the Highway Trust Fund to protect the, the resources along the byway. And then uh, another conference uh, looking at, uh, in 88, looking at spec uh, spectrum of possible actions such as in creating an advisory committee, creating standards and criteria for, for designation and seeking legislative authority for, for designation. And then the National Scenic Byway Study 1991, another report to Congress required by the Appropriations Act, um, but it, what was important was the timing of it because it came out in 91, right at the time that Congress was deliberating Ice-T, so it fed directly into Ice-T, and along with the support of Scenic American, Historic National Trust for Historic Preservation, American Recreation Coalition, and, and uh, American Recreation, uh, can't remember who all I mentioned, I'm having a Perry moment here, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the big four, AAA, Scenic America, the Trust, and, and ARC, um, they, were, they really were very supportive of uh, getting, it, getting the program included, and that called for the establishment. So in ICE-T, it called for, or the, I'm sorry, the study called for an establishment of a scenic byway program that would include techniques for maintaining and enhancing the scenic, recreational, and historic qualities associated with the byways. Now this slide is somewhat one-dimensional because it doesn't really look at the rich history of scenic roads and parkways, you know, going back to the Bronx River Parkway in, in, uh, in, the, in the early 1900s and the historic Columbia River Highway and the parkway, whole parkway movement, if you will, that's associated with the expansion of parks. It overlooks the designation of state and local scenic byways that was happening either through legislation or, and even over, and then, and then plus there were still other states that were in, you know, by the, by, uh, by in the 80s, by the 80s, they had well-established scenic byway programs. Uh, states such as California, Colorado, New, New York, Oregon, Washington, Wisconsin. Wisconsin was more of a rustic road program, and plus it also the uh, the Heritage Trail program that that uh, in Texas that I think Don's going to talk about quite a bit. So, but as a result of all these studies, some of the federal agencies started to act. The national Forest, uh, U.S. Forest Service designated National Scenic, National Forest Scenic Byways. You had um, um, the Bureau of Land Management designating backcountry byways, and then with the National Scenic Byway Program that started in Ice-T, there led to the designation of uh, 150 National Scenic Byways or All American Roads. What was important about the Scenic Byways, the National Scenic Byways Program, compared to the Forest Service and the BLM and other programs like that, is not only was it a designation program and a recognition program. It included uh, discretionary grants for byways. These are the eight eligible activities, development of state and tribal uh, scenic byway programs, um, 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 planning, developing and implementing corridor management plans, which included a broad range of activities and projects, safety improvements, such as turning lanes, passing lanes, byway facilities, such as another broad category included interpretive centers, byway visitor centers, turnouts, um, and access to recreation parks and whatnot. And uh, historic preservation was included in resource protection as well as scenic easements. The key eligibility requirements were project needed to be on along a byway, 
and that can use the benefit to why they travel. So this is just a simple pie chart showing the percentage of how the $507 million that was, off, that was used out of the National Scenic Byway Program for over 3,000 projects where it was used. And you can see that some of the broad categories that I mentioned, that's where a lot of the money went. These are some, just some samples of things that were done. The brochures, um, the pullouts, uh, visitor centers, you know, little, little, little uh, rest restroom down there on the right-hand corner is a part of the trail. Interpretive kiosk and markers. Oh, this is a slide that doesn't show up. Uh, it's the Highway Trust Fund ticker. Um, uh, if I wanted to look into, make sure I got the right one here. Okay, kind of taking a look at the National Scenic Byway Program and what the prospects are for for restoring dedicated funding. It really needs to be looked at in the broader context of, of the challenges facing tra transportation funding. And what these charts don't show on the screen is that essentially the trust fund is, is going down. You probably heard some, some of about some of that in the news. By August, September, it, it, it's projected to be insolvent. And so Congress is going to have to deal with that. Uh, and, uh, and, and MAP 21 is coming to an, coming to an end. Transportation legislation needs to be reauthor reauthorized. It's a big challenge. Um, the underlying things affecting the trust fund, as we heard earlier, BMPs leveling off, um, fuel economy taking uh, is uh, improving greatly. Plus, plus you have in introduction of hybrids that's not reflected in this. So, all of the, in the end, though, this really means that there's less. Re this is another factor affecting the amount of revenue coming into the trans and coming into the trust fund. And so, without changes in the use highway user taxes. High trust, the highway trust fund revenues will continue to decline, and, we'll, and we'll continue to rely on revenue from the general fund to support surface transportation. Prospects for uh, for another round of designations, um, there's still still a possibility. Uh, the map 21, while it didn't include any dedicated funding for byways, um, the secretary of transportation still has the authority to to designate roads and. Uh, Federal Highway is uh, is uh, is considering the possibility of announcing a request for a application for possible designation for possible national designation. Um, winding down here, the status of state programs. Um, state programs. States have pretty strong scenic byway program, um, and the National Scenic Byway Program. Well, most states. <laughs> Uh, sta um, over 30 states uh, established or revamped their programs using the funding that was through the through the National Scenic Byway Program. Um, in the fall, last fall, the foundation did a survey of of, of the uh, state byway coordinators. We re got responses from two thirds of those. Some of those said that their program was strong for now, while the, particularly while the remaining fund while the remaining projects using the National Scenic Byway funds were being implemented, there was some uncertainty about what's next. And, by, and they promised notably, though, that they said that the, noto that the majority of their byways are really mo moving forward or, or, and moving ahead. And, uh, they, they, and they also said that the project funding is the number one need, and that's what we're hearing from byways. They really dedicated funding as their number one priority. Last, last year at uh, Destination Capitol Hill that was sponsored by USA Travel, um, we had several members of our board meet with we meet with their congressional delegates and congressional and their and some of the ones and some of the staff and members from the uh, key committees House Public Work House Infrastructure and Public Transportation Infrastructure and uh, House and then Senate Environment and Public Works. Um, we hand gave them a gave them a letter saying that uh, our position is that dedicated funding is the ideal, but. Certainly, uh, for now, clarifying that byway projects, the eight eligible uh, category, eight eligibility, el eligibility categories, it would be helpful to clarify that those, all of those projects would be eligible for transportation alternative funds that are 
that, that replace enhancement bond. Um, oh, another slide that didn't pop up. Um, looking back at the study, um, some of this, kind of looking back at some of the studies that I mentioned, um, can you finish up? Okay. Let me see. Tell you what, I'll, I'll, since the slide's not there, I'll skip ahead. Oh, oh, oh not that. I'll skip to the end. Yeah, the outlook for byways are strong. Um, byways are stronger than they were 25 years ago, and the byways existed before the National Scenic Byway Program, and they were they were, and they were sustainable before then. In many ways, um, we were back where we were before the byway program started, um, and uh, the byways will continue to grow. The, but the best ones were the ones that that could cobble together cobble together money from different sources, and that's what they're that's what they're doing today. Um, and again, we we value. Scenic America is an important partner for byways, and we look forward to continuing working with you and strengthening our relationship um, to advance our common interests. Thank you very much. This is a lesson in high tech. <laughs> and I want to point out that Judy is my clicker person, so if there's any problems, you know who to blame. Thank you, Judy. Some of you know the. Um, uh, right under here. I just had a stroke last December, and she came and said, "You're going to be speaking at this conference." And at that point in time, I was flat on my back, and my left side didn't work. So uh, <laughs> anyway, I followed her her in directions. Oops. Um, tourism taking the scenic route. It's my honor to talk with you, true believers who ha know the importance of scenic beauty. My perspectives on scenic issues have been shaped by many years in local government and local tourism. I wish to underscore three things in my comments. One, the importance of scenic factors to the success of tourism. Two, the growth in political attitudes that make achieving scenic goals increasingly difficult. And three, local and state tourism lessons relevant to scenic America. In my early career, I had the opportunity to intern with the National Capital Planning Commission and to study the achievements of D.C. planning, which have made that area one of the great tourism destinations in the world. Later, I served as city manager of Alexandria, Virginia. The beautiful George Washington Parkway goes right through Old Town and is, in fact, one of the tremendous successes as a, as a scenic road connecting important historic designations or destinations. So I witnessed in that, that period of time the important connection between scenic drives and tourism success. And Old Town is certainly one of the, the beneficiaries of all of that. There can be no doubt that uh, there is an important connection between successful tourism and scenic protection. Tourists do not wish to travel along ugly routes to get to ugly destinations. It's about as simple as that. However, we, we must distinguish between types of tourism. Major sports and gambling venues and Times Square type of uh, entertainment districts have a great love for bright lights and, and uh, signs. On the other hand, nature areas, historic districts, small town Main Street areas, upscaled commercial and mixed use development, cultural centers, and many downtowns have demonstrated the importance of protecting scenic features to attract visitors and to grow business. I have also uh, w seen the importance of scenic protection for tourism while as city manager of Fort Worth and as president of the Convention and Visitor Bureau. 20 years ago, at a critical time in the revitalization of uh, Fort Worth, my wife, Judy, and the other members of Scenic Fort Worth were successful in having the City Council ban 
new uh, or establish a ban against new billboards. However, the fight never ends. Last month, in the face of major highway expansion, scenic Fort Worth warriors, as I call them, the, uh, had to educate the current city council on the realities of billboards, how little they pay in taxes, and the fact that citizens don't like them. Citizens, also voters, don't like them. I admire the hard work and smart political savvy that it takes to deal with billboards at the local level. And I salute the Fort Worth Warriors for their recent success. I would like, we have two warriors, would they both stand up here, Margaret DeMoss and Judy? Give it. Now, I call them warriors, but they've been given a lot of other names that are not appropriate to repeat in a public <laughs> event like this, so there they are. I do not think it is a coincidence that over these 20 years, the value of tourism in Fort Worth grew from approximately uh, $500 million to almost $1.5 billion. Nor is it a coincidence that the three primary historic tourism areas of the city Downtown, the historic stockyards, and the cultural museum districts are essentially free of billboards. The latest kudo is that downtown Fort Worth was just ranked number one for livability in its population category, which I think uh, reflects greatly on the fact that, of that the concern that has been taken to the, the visual issues of, of downtown. The economic value of Texas tourism is huge. In 2012, direct spending for travel in Texas was $65 billion. Tourism is one of the state's main industries today with over a half a million jobs. Putting a dollar value on scenic tourism is very difficult as we've been talking about really all day, but also very, very important. However, research clearly shows, as it was mentioned earlier, that. Cultural and nature travelers spend significantly more than other categories of travelers. H Scenic Texas may wish to explore the state's re ongoing research, because the state of Texas, despite some other things that are not so progressive, the state of Texas really does excellent research on, on tourism. And I think that building a relationship with the research companies that do this research, I think we can generate more data that would be useful or scenic issues that we face. Although Texas has some good examples of protecting scenic values, they also have some of the worst examples of roadway ugliness. Disappointingly, state, uh, Texas state leaders have refused to participate in the National Scenic Byways Program, as we just were seeing. While Texas happily takes federal money for ribbons of concrete roads and for military bases, the state objects to programs considered infringement on quote unquote state rights or ones that they think are contrary to individual property rights. Scenic concerns unfortunately tend to be a low priority for the political leaders of Texas in the, in the state government. However, key cities have taken strong actions to apply scenic values. I applaud the city of, of Houston for you, what you have achieved and it's so, and so beautifully explained. The, the, you, however, you go outside the kind of the controls of Houston, and I must say there are more than a few billboards out there, some of which I, are because of the, the state um, or the federal law. But you know, actually the Woodlands is a great example of where scenic values and scenic attention, attention uh, the investment of keeping trees has really paid off, and it is a, one of the great success stories really proving the point that, that scenic concern pays off. The, the Houston example has been followed across the state and some many other cities where local governments, when they have the authority to, to control signage and land use and other standards, they take advantage of it. More than 500 cities across, uh, cities and towns across Texas have limited or banned billboards. And I think here is the distinction between the local perspective and what you see in the state legislature. However, weak county government co governments are a barrier to controlling the visual blight across the state. 
and the, here we are in, a, in an issue between the local government, town, and city authority granted by the state and what is granted to the counties. And this is one of the huge problems for us in Texas. In uh, last year, I was contacted by Burnett County, north of San Antonio, to help with their, their tourism program. They felt the growing number of billboards in the county was undercutting the tourism and resort potential of the county, which is known for the beautiful Marble Falls area. Texas county governments lack that authority to deal with billboards, and the state and has repeatedly refused to grant the ability to counties to make that decision at the local level. And I applaud Scenic Texas for pursuing that issue, and I think it's a very important one to pursue. Unfortunately, billboard companies have a strong influence with state legislators, and we can all guess why. The problem is growing with the uh, money involved in electronic billboards, which is opening up a whole new set of cans of worms, you might say. Billboards, plus the billboard industry can make really good friends I quote unquote, through selective billboard donations. And I think we've all seen that in our local situations. Despite these problems, Texas has operated programs through its Texas Historic mm, excuse me, Historical Commission that have been very successful in revitalizing small towns across the state. The Texas Historical Commission should be a, should be a useful partner in all of these issues that we're dealing with here as far as scenic protection. In 1968, in conjunction with the Hemisphere Program in San Antonio, uh, the state created 10 historic trail districts that covered the entire state. This program was revived through federal funds, which may go away, uh, in the, and, but this program has right today 7,000 miles of roads. And I do think an opportunity is to work a relationship between Scenic Texas and this existing program because I think they have the same kind of goals but really aren't coordinated together in the way that they should be. Although state, Texas does have an active Main Street program, the issue is the current political environment. And I think that maybe some people have, have been drinking too much tea and it's gone to their head with regard to budgets. And certain people, you know, they've never seen a deficit level that they like. So it's all, in fact, the big issue right now with Texas is, you know, how much they're going to cut back taxes because they, the, the economy has been good. Instead of looking at what are the things that need to be funded, and many of those things are in, the, in this world that we're just now talking about. And there is a new potential the, uh, at the national level. The National Park Service is about to present Congress with a recommendation to add the Chisholm and the Western Trails to the National Historic Trail Program. Now, I know all of you, you probably, everyone saw Red River and remembered John Wayne driving the 10,000 cattle up north. Well, these are the two major cattle trails and, they, and the, the Park Service is recommending that they become National Historic Trails. And I think it, the, there's a 300 page report, it's going to Congress, or it's going first to the 60 day review and then, and then to, to Congress. And I think this is an opportunity for Scenic Texas and all of the, the scenic programs in the states because the, the trails go all the way up to Canada. And I think that we should jump on that, encourage its passage, which is not going to be easy, really, by Congress given this environment that we are in. Well, in conclusion, number one, there can be no doubt that there are scenic portions, uh, that the that scenic values are important to tourism success and I think we all need to kind of work on how we demonstrate that in ways that resonates with the elected officials, particularly at the state level. I encourage us to build um, stronger uh, bridges connecting existing historic programs such as the program that I just mentioned here in, in Texas because I think there are opportunities to work together. We need to take, number three, we need to take charge of the word game too often, scenic vision is labeled as a liberal big government concern, but there is nothing more conservative than protecting history, respecting the land, enhancing central cities, preserving our small towns. We need to reframe the scenic values as the conservative values that, that they really are. And finally, turning to the one of the, the great uh, scenic 
uh, value persons, Dr. Seuss. He offered a definitive, definitive proof that scenic concerns are important. In his 1957 booklet for La Jolla, California, entitled Signs of Civilization, certain irony to the, the title of it, Dr. Seuss showed that cavemen and even dinosaurs were driven away from their homes by visual chaos of uncontrolled signs. Since Dr. Seuss has been embraced by one of our own great senators, quote unquote, uh, Senator Cruz, what more proof do we really need that scenic root, routes are the right route, the conservative route to take to quality tourism, better communities, and improve business opportunities? Thank you very much. Get the clicker. Yep. So good good afternoon all and as was first stated, I guess I'm the last person between <laughs> okay. So the other thing I would say to Rod is that I made my last presentation in January and I too have notes. So the duration from the last time doesn't make a lot of difference. But I'm uh, delighted to be here to talk about our experience today uh, in, on this topic. And when I say this topic, uh, we're talking about exactly how uh, we in Houston have had almost a 40-year uh, excursion in keeping advertising off of our buses, shelters, and uh, other metro facilities and the like. So it's been quite interesting uh, as we've gone through, but as you, for those of you who live here, you know we have no advertising. And for those of you who may be visiting, you may have noticed um, that our vehicles are free of advertisement. And as I um, talked through the, our process, uh, it was interesting that I sort of went to Scenic America's website and I saw these items. Uh, one, uh, goals being to safeguard scenic qualities of American <coughs> communities, and then these points. Uh, education, educated citizen, citizenry, a core committed scenic activist, business community that understands the economic value of beauty, uh, public policy that defends natural beauty, and technical expertise. And so when you look at those things, I, I think you'll see as we go through the comments this afternoon that that's exactly what we've applied here in Houston uh, as we've had this uh, experience in trying to maintain our our character of our urban systems. So a little bit of history. I mentioned that this first started almost 40 years ago. So the first time we saw uh, the push to, okay, so this is funny to me because I talk with my hands. <laughs> and so I was just trying to figure out, now what am I gonna do with this clicker? And so I've, I almost put it down a few minutes ago, but I thought, no, hold it. But the point is that back in 1978, uh, there was a company who came to the city with this proposal to put advertising on the shelters. And thereafter, the city council was about to do it, but thereafter, um, there was mobilization of the citizenry. Uh, at that time, it was before Scenic Houston actually came into fruition, but this mobilization of the citizenry, and, and over the next 30 days, they actually created an organization they drafted a, rev a referendum petition, you know, went around and had people sign to get on the ballot that we wanted to vote against having this advertising on our shelters. They got the appropriate number of signatures 
and then got city council to have um, actually that initiative placed on the ballot. So over the next 11 months, uh, this organization educated the public, which was one of the, in the first bullets that we saw. Uh, the media got involved, and when we had a response from the media, and once they were convinced, we saw a column in the newspaper by one of our local uh, media personalities, and he wrote in his column essentially that what we're going to see with this advertising is not going to be positive, and secondly, it isn't going to bring in the funding that is proposed. So that was uh, very helpful in the days before the vote. So then what did we see with the vote? We saw 56% of Houstonians saying no to this advertising. So that was our first initiative and our first foray into this. And again, this is back in 1979 by this time. So fast forward, our most recent uh, opportunity to uh, again, make our position known was last year and the year before when Metro was ap approached by a company that wanted to provide advertising on the bu buses. Um, Metro at that time started a real detailed study called asset monetiz monetization. Uh, the point was to try to see if raising advertisement could raise money. Uh, I'll put a sidebar here and say that this was the fast forward and this was most recent. I was actually on the Metro Board in 2002 to 2004 and during uh, my tenure there was also um, another initiative to try to get billboards on and billboards and advertising on Metro uh, facilities and structures. Um, it also had happened again in the late 1980s so we see it again recurring over and over. Well, this time, though, was the most extensive study on Metro's part. And the other times, it, it usually uh, sufficed for, you know, Scenic Houston by that time and others to just verbalize to the Metro board that they were uninterested in this and that it was really contrary to what we see and see ourselves as, as in terms of our view of our city, and that was enough. But this time, Metro actually undertook this pretty extensive study to look at how much money would be brought in uh, for each of the various components, the shelters, the buses. There was talk about uh, wrapping some of the trains. There was, t there was talk of naming rights of metro transit centers and stations. So it was really extensive. And so what uh, we saw Scenic Houston do at that point is to mobilize uh, testimony. And this was through uh, speaking at the Bet metro board meetings. And the thing about the metro board meetings is they're now streamed. So not only do the people see what's going on who are in the boardroom, but also people who are sitting around the city looking at their computers while the meetings are being streamed. So that happened. Uh, there were op-ed pieces uh, done. And those op-ed pieces is going to sort of link with the importance of including the business community because our op-ed pieces were written by leaders in the community that people know uh, are very well known in terms of leading the city through uh, certain initiatives. And so they wrote our op-ed pieces. Uh, we had letter writing campaigns. Uh, we coordinated the operation so that the pieces uh, were working together. And then uh, we ended up by the end of the year where with Metro actually uh, deciding that there was not going to be enough finances raised uh, through the advertising to make it worth it. And so one of the board members actually sat there and talked about how much money was going to be raised, and then he equated it to how much <coughs> service it could buy. And when he did that, what looked like hundreds of thousands of dollars compared to the budget of $350 million ended up not by about like a, a half of a bus route for half of a year. So again, when you looked at it in that, in that way, it sort of put it in perspective, and so that was uh, really an important thing to do. We had on the technical facts, okay, I'm way behind. So this was the Lynn Ashby article. And this was our 56% no vote. And um, this is our most recent effort that I just talked through. So what that proves is that we really could talk to people and exclude the death by PowerPoint, right?
right, so this is where I want to be at this point. So we, again, talked about the fact that the income potential was not significant, the fact that we were able to get the public rally. Uh, one of the points that we made to Metro is the one about First Amendment rights, because when people are thinking about advertising, they envision uh, beautiful ads about, um, you know, take a trip to Hawaii or, you know, something else very desirable, but uh, we were able to point out to Metro that you would not be able from a First Amendment perspective to control the type of advertising that uh, is on. Uh, Washington, D.C. had um, an, an, a whole issue and set of litigations because there was a, an ad on one of their shelters to legalize marijuana. Uh, and I'll show you some other uh, examples later. I mean, but there, you know, there were all kind of negative things that uh, the transit agencies around the country have not been able to, uh, to, to keep out because of First Amendment rights. So we pointed that out to them. And the thing that was important about that was that their attorneys had told them that that would not be a problem, that they would be able to prohibit undesirable advertising. But we were, you know, we were able to say to them, only until you're sued. You can say no at first, but when you get your first lawsuit, and then that's going to, to crumble on you. So the other thing, and um, I think it was, um, I can't remember, one of the previous two speakers talked about the new spectacular signs, what I think we have a tendency to call them, flashing lights, big, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I happen to think that that's one of the um, issues that causes safety concerns. Uh, because people are driving and then you see these flashing lights, you have this instinct to look and try to read when you shouldn't be. I mean, you talk about distracted driving, that would be distracted driving at its prime. But I think the same thing with uh, some of the wraps that they were talking about on the buses and the trains. Uh, they did wrap some of the, Metro did allow some of the trains to be wrapped about two years ago. And it was f fascinating because you've got this vehicle that will seat 200 people and it's wrapped with an image, rail size, vehicle size, of one of the Texans football players. And so I'm sitting at a stop light one day and the train runs by and there's this giant image of a football player. So, you know, okay. Well, you know I wanna say, did I do that? Okay. He didn't, he didn't say I didn't. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, but anyway, the point is I think that there are safety concerns that could be associated with some of the spectacular wrapping, the spectacular signs that we haven't actually explored, and I think that it's, it merits that kind of exploration. So with the guiding principles, I'm now gonna start turning and looking at my slides. Uh, with the guiding principles, uh, we want to adhere to all of the things that we've already established. Uh, no new billboards, and we've been fortunate here in having our city council on our side and passing legislation that does prohibit billboards in uh, certain locations, and that's been alluded to. That's really helped us a lot. Uh, it's real important to remain vigilant, and that's at the bottom, but I think it, it's hugely important uh, to keep your eye on the ball. Some of the, the middle watch for questionable actions, you know, sort of alerts us to sort of under handed ways to kind of slink into some of the things that they know that there may be opposition to, those who would desire those things. And then having the strong uh, civic group, the citizens group, is, is hugely important because it has the, the ready capability to act very quickly uh, when uh, issues arise. Um, I would say that this is going to come up again for us in this, um, in this city. Uh, the reason is that the transit agencies are so financially strapped, and that was the impetus for Metro looking so intently the last time because they see themselves with essentially very little um, tax infusion given the need. I mean, we heard the talk uh, from Steve Kleinberg about the pressures of this community growing, and, and then there was a discussion about the highway um, trust fund that's diminishing. And so it really is an intensely, financially uh, intensive sort of pressure box. And so it's going to rise again. 
And so Scenic Houston is going to continue to stay on the forefront of making the point that you can get a few hundred thousand dollars, but the truth is it's not going to get you enough service to buy enough riders to make it worth the disadvantage and what we lose by going down that path. Wanted to show a few images of our system, and I think you've probably seen it again uh, as you've traveled around, but just to uh, make the point that we're very happy that we don't have to look at this. Uh, obviously photoshopped. Again, images that people might can find very offensive when you start allowing advertising and seeing where you might end yourself. Um, we still, you know, there's still some vandalism, but the, the the point is that I first really got interested and involved in this because I had worked, when I worked at Metro, before I was on the board, uh, in an area called Crime to Prevention Through Environmental Design. It's called SEPTED. And the basic premise of that whole initiative is that your crime rate drops when, you, when your facilities and everything that you own is well maintained and it looks like somebody cares. And so I think that's the important thing about what we're doing here. So, you know, when you have a, you know, advertising and it doesn't look like people care, I think it invites other kinds of art. I mean, if you already have something on the shelter, why can't I come with my spray can and add something or make, or make your advertising image a little nicer? So I think that we minimize a lot of that by having our position on no advertising. So as we end, uh, going back to the, the sort of points I made at first that are on your Scenic America uh, webpage about those things that keep our community strong and that the Scenic community wants to stay engaged in, which is educating our citizenry, uh, you know, having this core of committed activists, keeping the business community informed in LinkedIn, uh, work with our elected officials to create public policy wherever we can that supports uh, what we're talking about and making sure that we have the technical base, that we, that we are able to use the data uh, to support our position in addition to the fact that it does matter how our visual environment appears to us. So that's my last uh, slide and I thank you so much. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank you, that was really, really good information. And I know a lot of people, especially in this room, are thinking about how to work with their metros on um, stopping this advertising assault. And have, have some of them have already lost that battle. So it's a big, it's a big deal. Um, anybody have any questions for any of these panel members? We have a few minutes before we, uh, Ron wraps up. Margaret DeMoss. Can, we, we, can you stand up and speak a little louder, please? The study that Metro did, is it available, I'm gonna look Carol? At, I'm going to look at Ann to say, is Ann? it available? Okay, so Ann, Scenic Houston will get that information to everybody. Bill Britton. Bill's from Jacksonville, Florida. No, no, and I think part of it is that Metro has never really initiated itself. Every time it's come to Metro, it's come from some outside entity who wants to be the advertiser, getting some residual off of the advertising. And I'm stunned that they hired lobbyists to, uh, I'm just stunned. Lawyers for, for, for Clear Channel Outdoor. Oh, oh my yeah. God.
and, and that's a, a very good point, and that actually came up in the Metro study by one of the board members who, who began to push back and question how they had developed those, those, th those estimates, and there were some real shaky assumptions going into the estimates, so you're 100% correct. Well, and, and to, to document the fact that the uh, projections for the advertising were exaggerated, I think, would be mm -hmm. very beneficial for others. Yeah. I mean, to we prove need that, that they're exaggerated. Yes. Milo. Hi. Uh, Milo uh, Hensley with uh, San Francisco Beautiful. Right now, our, our, our original training system, our export selection is considering installation of digital billboards. Um, and, of course, our battle's about memory. It's about print billboards and whether this knows that. I don't have anything um, written on that, and I haven't seen anything. But I will tell you, before the two, the two thousand, before this most recent um, cycle, that had been presented to Metro, and there was discussion about putting the ads in frames and framing it like art, you know, all those kind of things. So, but I don't have anything written. <laughs> I just have the anecdotal that we've heard that before. Anybody else, artists? Not from that standpoint, I don't know if this was repaired, but I heard through a third party who went to a conference, and I, so I know it was true, that one of the conference attendees was saying that when they had a wrap on their vehicle, and the vehicle caught on fire, and they couldn't open the emergency hatch. Mm. They had to have somebody come and, and cut the emergency hatch to get the people out of the vehicle. So that's something, um, again, that I don't have in writing, but that I've heard from a verbal standpoint. I did bring it up when we were talking with Metro that I had heard about this wrap business. You know, everybody can go in and out of the front door, but in emergency, you know, the hatch is in the ceiling of the bus. And so they had wrapped the, the taken the wrap across the, the roof, and so they couldn't get the emergency hatch open. From the standpoint of seeing in, um, as long as the people in the bus can see out, I think that's what's priority. So it's okay that you can't see in, and some systems are, are going to deliberately make it so that you can't see inside the vehicle, but as long as the people in can see out, that's where the, the focus is. Anybody else? Susan. I'm interested in too much byway funding and whether any kind of a toll road or a little patch in the county uh, creates the too much byway hazard. What are other sources of funding for the funding that the federal government or the state government? Um. I'm really not aware of, of all the, what, what uh, local byways have done to look at other revenue sources uh, like, like the ones that you suggested uh, to support byways. Generally, they, um, they'll cobble, cobble together money through, um, you know, through the people who are partners in the byway, uh, through businesses, through uh, other local nonprofit organizations. They'll, they'll file, you know, they'll, They'll look for grant foundation money. They'll they'll compete for transportation alternative fund uh, money. They'll they'll just uh, look for money wherever they can and do their own fundraising. Any more comments? Yeah, go yeah. ahead, Doug. I think one of the dilemmas is if you start talking about fees, uh, you've got to how do you, the cost of collecting the fees is really very significant and gets you you know and then the alternative to that is a pass, but that doesn't really work. You know, for visitors who are coming new to that that you know that byway, so so there's some real dilemmas I think of, of trying to collect money that way. Bill Johnson. 
Okay, anybody else? Ron, you want to come do a wrap up and thank you for this panel. Great information. Thank you. Thank you.